Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by apparently the prophet or secret writer amongst us from the Game of Thrones television show, Preston Jacobs. Preston. I, I got a lot of things wrong about about this episode. What are you, you saying? You, what, like, I don't know what you're talking about. What, did you, you you even commented on that thing I posted on Twitter about yeah. what you said? Yeah, yeah, no, I was like, I was like, I couldn't, you know, I didn't think they were gonna do the the mad, the mad uh, queen thing. I just mm. thought it was, it was just too. Uh, but they did, they did. Every time know. you say, it's totally ridiculous. They would never do it. They fucking yeah. do it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. No, I said it was like the most ridiculous, like fan servicey thing based on like fan theories. For those of you who don't know what the hell we're talking about, on my Twitter, I pinned it. Go, go to Red Team, uh, go to twitter.com slash redteamreview. There's a clip of Preston when we did the live stream, I think it was on my channel or your channel, where someone asked us, is Mad Queen happening? And you said, no, they would never do that because, you know, no no show has the balls to do that, have two female lead villains. Yeah, and and both be both be crazy and have it be, be super sexist, but yes, no, they, they, they did it. Just like, so it's like, yeah, I kind of, I, anytime I say what's the worst possible outcome, it seems to happen. You are a prophet. Um, uh, yeah. Guys, thank you so much for joining us again. This time we're going to be discussing season eight, episode five, The Bells. As always, we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes. Consider checking us out on those platforms. And if you do, please leave us a review on iTunes. It does help out a lot. Also, leave your questions and comments down below. We may discuss it in the next podcast episode. Okay, so Preston... A couple of orders of business. The first thing is, uh -huh. I've been getting bombarded with people telling me that the actor for Barris and Selmy uh -huh. has been going around saying that the two books are finished and that there's a deal with HBO where George plans on releasing it after the show ends. Well, I don't know if he's been going around, but yes, he did appear at a con uh, where he said that. He said, oh, you know, it's my understanding that... that uh, 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 Winds of Winter and Dream of Spring are, are finished and then he made a deal with with uh, d and d not to release them until the show was done. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. First off, you have to say, like, why would this random actor have that inside information? I think he went, I think he was on some sort of internet site and read something ridiculous and then repeated it. Um, because George R. R. Martin went on, had to go on his blog and and say, no, this is... Wait a minute, are you saying that old people are reading random things online and spreading misinformation? What? No, of I, course they, not. They, they, I mean, it's the most popular cable news channel, uh, <laughs> the most popular cable channel, so, I think. So what did George R. R. Martin say on his blog? He said, um, every so often, one of these stories gains an improbable currency, and just chuckling at the insanity no longer suffices. That seems to be happening right now. All of a sudden, this crazy story about my, my finishing The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring years ago is popping up everywhere. No, I'm not going to provide links. I do not want to reward purveyors of misinformation with hits. I will, however, say for the record, no, The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring are not finished. Dream has not even begun. I'm not going to start writing Volume 7 until I finish Volume 6. It seems absurd that I need to state this. The world is round. The earth revolves around the sun. Water is wet. Do I need to say that too? It boggles me that anyone would believe the story, even for an instant. It makes not a whit of sense. Why would I sit for years on completed novels? Why would my publishers, not just here in the U.S., but around the world, ever consent to this? They make millions and millions of dollars every time a new Ice and Fire book comes out, as do I. Delaying makes no sense. Why would HBO want the books delayed? The books helped create interest in the show, just as the show creates interest in the books. And yeah, you know, it keeps going on and on. Yes, that's true, but I also don't agree with him on, on several points. First off, yes, the books help create interest in the show. However, the books can also cause, cause division amongst people who would rather just read the books and not watch the show. This is how I was with The Walking Dead. I actually would rather read The Walking Dead comics than watch the show because it's just so different and I like the comics better. I like the direction mm -hmm. the comics are going in much, much, much better. People will stop... So for some reason, Game of Thrones doesn't have this problem, but people will stop watching a show if it gets too bad. That's how I was with the last two seasons of Sons of Anarchy. Um, that's how I was with the last season of How I Met Your Mother. I didn't watch a good chunk of the last season, just the last episode, and, like, I just did not really care. Thrones, people love to hate watch it. 
Sure, but in in a game theory sense, it, he's right. Like you have to remember that his his publishers are not the same interests as HBO. If if HBO and the publishers were the same company, then you know perhaps you could you could understand some sort of strange delay. But in fact, he's also right that the interest feeds into each other. The fact that he that that George R. Martin is not releasing his book this year or the year before, the year before that, um, means his publisher has lost millions of dollars. I don't know. I, maybe there is a backroom deal with HBO and the publisher and George that we all don't know about, and th he's under contract to say that. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, far too, that's far too conspiracy theory even for me. Mm. The, uh, it's just, it's just uh, no, there's, it's, it's too many. That's the thing about like, conspiracies and cartels is that the more actors you have, the harder they are to keep together. Um, which, is, which is one of these things why all these government conspiracies that people believe, like X-Files, can never happen. The government has too many people working for it. It's too many leaks. You know, everything gets leaked eventually. Um, and so you, this, would, this would never be, able, you couldn't keep this a secret. It wouldn't, it, you know, somebody, you wouldn't be able to pay the money to keep everyone together. And, and that's the thing is there's just uh, there's just too much there's just too many too much money at stake. Um, not to mention that you know he could die any second. Like do you really? <laughs> it's it's just it's just silly. Like no um, no yeah that makes a lot of sense. Also another thing that he said in that same blog you you were telling me about it w was there a rumor that he hates the actor for Braun? I yeah I'd never heard this uh, this rumor but apparently on the internet someone was claiming that. The kid, that that he hated the actor for Braun, and he said total bullshit, not a shred of truth. I created Braun, so it'd be. It, it, this is what I I I really kind of I laugh at George R. R. Martin's writing because George R. R. Martin's writing is so different than George R. R. Martin's speaking. Mm -hmm. Like George R. R. Martin writing is this very like vulgar, straight at you, um, uh, crude. Uh, very subtle, um, uh, like character. He's from Jersey. Um, he, he is. Yeah. He's from Jersey. But when you talk to him, he puts on this "I'm a cute little guy" voice, and you think, "Oh, George is so harmless." And you're like, "No, like he's he's freaking biting. Like mm -hmm. he reads he read, he writes stories about people fucking their twin sister and 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 like chopping people up into pies and like all and anti-war narratives and all this, you know." And, and mistrusting the government and all this stuff. And, but when you see him in these, in these interviews, he tries to be, he tries to be cutesy. Uh, but then when you read his writing, it's like, poof, like punch. Um, yeah, total bullshit, not a shred of truth. I created Braun, so it would be immodest of me to say he's a terrific character. But what the hell, he's a terrific character. And my readers will definitely be seeing more of him in the books to come. And, and Jeremy Flynn, has, or Jerome Flynn, has been wonderful. It's been an honor to work with him. He's done a marvelous job bringing Braun to life. Again, don't believe anything you read on the internet. You know, I'd never heard that. Heard that. Uh, heard that rumor. I mean, I know Lena Lena Headey doesn't like him. <laughs> Wait, Lena Headey doesn't like? Uh, oh, Jerome Flynn. I thought you were gonna say George R. R. Martin. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, yeah, I think we all know about that. And the last order of business I wanted to get into is uh, this one guy named Aaron M who messaged me, and normally I don't do this, but I feel like, you know, you, 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 should, you should get some of this, um, even now and then, from, from even my fans. Um, uh, what did he say here? This one guy goes, uh, tell, this, send this pre tell this message to Preston. He goes, I just wanted to tell you, talking to you, just wanted to tell you the, that the line built by the King's Landing Christian community is absolutely the hardest I have laughed at any single line <laughs> in a Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire video ever. Your videos have always been the best, GOT, A Song of Ice and Fire content on YouTube. The details you connect and the research you do has always been staggering, but your writing scripts and comedic timing for your videos for Season 8 are becoming very close to matching the qualities, uh, the quality of your theory and research-based output. So this is a super fan of yours. He wanted me to make sure that uh, I told you this. And I have to agree, man. You are, you are hilarious. I always get this in the comments <laughs> section. People will always go, Carmine, Preston's not even saying anything funny. Why are you laughing? I'm laughing because we talk all the time off the like not even about thrones and you say the most random crazy shit that comes out of nowhere. The first time we've met, 
you told me how to get like a free trip to Israel and some pussy. Like you came out of nowhere with that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I I I I, I am. I don't. I know what I'm talking. About. Yeah, I know. What, I know the conversation we had. Yeah, yeah, like you just say like like I'll have a conversation with you. Like Preston, what do you think about uh, this character? <laughs> Fuck that character. That character is fucking stupid. During the recording of the podcast. Preston, what do you think about that character? Well, Carmine, I think that character is a lovely character. And I just, <laughs> like, like you just are such, like, you Well, it's, it's like, it's like what it's we funny. Were, it's like what we were talking about with, uh, with George R. R. Martin. Like, in, in fact, we, we, you know, we kind of think of ourselves as being these unified, like, uh, con- pieces of consciousness. But it's funny how different friends will bring out different aspects of your personality. Um, you're a different person writing. You're a different person speaking. You know, you're a different person talking to your parents. You're a different person at work. And uh, different things, you know, at different times, different aspects of, uh, of, of uh, you know, oneself comes out. That's all, you know. You know, I, I, I can be very different when, like, look, I grew up in a suburb of Baltimore. Like, you grew up in Jersey. And there, there's, there's something to, like, the way East Coasters talk to each other that, 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 that can be very crude and, you know, like you and I kind of understand that. And so when we're offline, like I can I can talk like I can talk Baltimore and you can talk Jersey. And like, you know, there, there's 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 that connection. But, I'm, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be crude Baltimore uh, on, on the pod on the podcast. I know. Just like, but I'm it's not just it's just Baltimore. so funny. <laughs> just like the shit you say. I'm like, oh, it is, I'm thinking to myself, oh, that's what he's going to gonna say here. OK, that's not what you thought <laughs> off, off the off the recording. But OK, <laughs> well, that that's everyone, though. No, I'm, yeah. You know, I wish I had that restraint that you do, though. I, I, I'm 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 this person 24 seven, unfortunately. But um, I don't know. <laughs> you're more vulgar than you are online uh, as well when you're not on the podcast. But uh, everybody is. Everybody is. Everybody, you know, has their public persona and their and their private persona. You know, their their bro, their bro per- persona, their their persona that they, they have in, in front of their their uh, significant other. It's not that they're not all you. They are. They're like all of these things. But we're not we're not uh, we're not one thing you know we're many things sometimes sometimes I, I i stand back and i even examine my own personality and i'm like like as a as a as a outside observer and i'm like huh that was really weird of me that's weird that i did that you know it's aspects of finding yourself oh well anyway continue on to game of thrones <laughs> so let's start with this episode what did you think of the episode overall once again i'm giving it a 10 out of 10 simply because there were no gilly scenes you <laughs> um a lot of people were super, super, super disappointed with this one. I actually thought it was better than episode two or three, which are which I'm you know not was not a great fan of. Um, I liked it more than episode two or three, and I liked it. Maybe it's because Lena Headey was fucking hilarious in this episode. She was so fucking good, um, and and. The way she just used her, the way she just looked at various scenes, like when she, when when she just tiptoed around the hound and and the mountain, like I'm gonna get out of here, that was so freaking funny. Or like when Danny was burning the city and her eyes just went a little bit wider, and I rewatched the scene a bunch, and it was like her eyes just went a little bit wider, and she was able to convey this holy shit, like look. I was just like, oh, man, like. It was pretty brilliant, and, and you know, and she, and she she acted the hell out of, out of her scene with um, with Jamie at the end, and I have to say that uh, the Dink um, acted the hell out of his scene with Jamie uh, uh, near the beginning of the episode. So um, there were some great acting moments uh, that carried the episode. Um, I think a lot of people are angry about the all of a sudden descent of. Of, of Danny and, it, and it's it, I've, I've heard betrayal is the word that everybody's <laughs> using the betrayal of Danny fans are, are calling this a betrayal and it's funny you say that everybody who had a scene with Jamie had a great scene with Jamie except for Euron uh but we'll get to that <laughs> no, the, yeah we'll get yeah, to that let's yeah. start with the episode so we start off with Varys writing several letters down mm. uh, someone pointed this out I didn't even see it he has several little little notes down that he's probably already sent out to the all the lords of Westeros and apparently yeah. he's been trying to poison Danny. Yeah, yeah, I missed that. My, um, my, 
my first couple watches through, it it I I stupidly thought, oh, he, her not eating is was signs of her being crazy, but no, her not eating is signs that she didn't eat the poison. Uh, I missed that. That was that was boneheaded of me. But uh, yeah, I, it, it, apparently he was trying to poison her. Yeah, which which makes a lot more sense. Um, I mean, it still doesn't get him off the island. His coup just still doesn't really make very much sense. Like, say say he successfully kills Danny, then what? Like, does he think Jon Snow is going to be able to ride Drogon, or do they just kill the dragon and they don't worry about it? But they unsu the Unsullied would just kill him. I mean, the the Unsullied would would go nuts. How how would the Unsullied know it was it was Varys though? I mean, I don't think Grey Worm's that stupid. True. The one thing that really annoyed me is Tyrion gave up Varys so damn easy. And mm. and it really <laughs> annoys me because, like, bro, he helped you. He saved you in the season four finale. He got you out of there. And you you want to do him dirty like that? Yeah, but... Yeah. I mean, it's odd because... Um, does Danny? Had the guards already informed Danny that she was being poisoned? You know, you know how Tyrion walks in and she already knows. Mm -hmm. She's just like, "I've been betrayed," and he's like, "Yeah." You're, you've, did you know? Did the guards already figure it out? Like because they were watching the little girl. Did did you know? Varys get caught. Um, it's kind of a mystery. Um, or you know, she just figures it. She just feels it. She could probably call that. John would have told Sansa, and Sansa would have told everybody else because she can put two and two together. She knows who John is. She knows the type of man he is, and she knows that he puts family first, and that mm. he would tell Sansa. And Sansa knows the connection between, you know, uh, Danny knows the connection between Sansa <clears throat> and Tyrion. So maybe she's just one step ahead of everybody <clears throat> when we're sure, not giving but, her the know, benefit of the doubt. Brand Brand could have spilled the beans, or you know. Sam and Gilly could be gossips. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because because uh, episode four, they're like they're like, how many people know about this secret? And he's like, including us, eight. And I was like, uh, including. I was like counting. I was like, it's actually nine. I think they forgot about Gilly. <laughs> but uh, I, I yeah, think everybody's trying people. to forget about Gilly. Let's be honest. Yeah, nine nine people knew the secret. Um, so it's it's not hard for it to go around. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I that's the thing is when he goes in, and he's like, oh. You've been, you know, I've been betrayed. It was John, and he's like, no, it's Varys. Is she, co is she like, reco like covering for herself? Like, did she think John was, like, was she paranoid that John actually betrayed her? And then when he said Varys, she was like, oh yeah, that's what, that's what I meant. See, it went through John, um, you know. <laughs> so, or did she figure out? Did she know it was Varys? I don't know. Well, to be fair, John. I mean, even though Sam and, and Bran know. Who's going to take Sam and Bran's word for it? It comes more from a guy who's essentially a war hero. So they're going to take John's but it's, word it's from more. Sam and it's from Sam and Bran originally. <laughs> it, it's from Sam and Bran originally, but I would take, like, nobody would care if, like, two random schmoes said this secret. But coming from Jon Snow, Lord Commander, Warden of the mm. North, a war hero, it has a bit more weight to it. So mm. the fact that it came from, it comes from Jon up top and goes to everybody else down. Even though he learned it from those two, he's still like at the top of this fucking secret. Yeah. So her saying that, you know, yeah, I don't like how Tyrion does Varys dirty here. I really don't. They were good friends and I Tyrion is such a stupid asshole these past couple of seasons. Ever since season six, he's just been so wasted. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Like, I miss those yeah. Tyrion episodes and those Tyrion moments we had in the first season. And clearly those were written by George, but uh, I don't know. It's, 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 Tyrion, like, Tyrion and Varys being part of her inner circle is, is perhaps, like, in a story about dragons and the undead, it's perhaps the most unrealistic thing. Like, I just don't see... I don't see Tyrion's advice at any point as being good enough that anyone would want it. Like, he's, he's, he's failed over and over again. He's emotionally compromised. And he's shown that he's been emotionally compromised because of his, he's, we're dealing with war with his brother and sister. He's biased. And, yeah, he's biased. And he's shown his betrayals over and over and over again. He's given bad advice. And he, he's acted treasonously. Um, 
just and it's just why would why would anyone have it? And then I mean, Varius, like again, like this is a guy that tried to poison you. Um, there's just no there's no logic in in having him as well. I mean, I guess in the beginning it was like, well, he brought in Dorn and and um, the Reach, and so we need Varys. If we kill him, maybe it would look suspicious, you know, for the Reachers and the Dornish because he was so good at pulling that off. But once the Dornish and the Reachers are gone, there's no reason to keep him around. He's 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 useless. He's nothing but a liability. It's almost like Varys' uh, whole storyline doesn't work without Illyrio Mapatis because that's that's like a major thing. It doesn't. It doesn't. Like, I um, they're twins, and and what's great about it is they're not necessarily completely on the same page. But there's something you know. One person handles Essos, one person handles Westeros, and uh, the, you know there's there's some communication and plausible deniability. Um, both ways and things like that. You need that other character. Um, and speaking of that yeah. other character that are twins, um, I gotta say, the actor for Varys, I can never say his name, is like Con- Conleth Hill or something. Mm, um, yeah. He said how he was super disappointed that he wasn't there for Littlefinger's demise because they've been nemesis, they've been nemeses throughout the entire series, and it's 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 a it's a huge travesty that he wasn't there for, for Littlefinger's death. And he even, you know, says that in an interview. And I got to agree, Varys should have been there for Littlefinger. I keep forget. I forgot all about Varys when we discussed Littlefinger's death. Um, mm. Yeah, Varys really should have been there. I mean, plot-wise, I don't know how I would have crammed him in. I mean, I guess maybe he, he you could send him north as... Actually, as no, 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 I, I'm, I'm stupid. We actually did discuss it. The way you could have done it was, instead of having the Brand 9000... Um, say the dagger is, you know, blah, 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 Varys could have come in there and told everybody that, actually, no, Littlefinger lied about the <clears throat> dagger because Varys was in the room when Kathleen and Ned were yeah. discussing it. So. But you'd have, to, you'd, have to, you'd have to shift it around. Rather than having Jon come to Dragonstone, you'd have to have Varys go to... Winterfell. Winterfell. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and things like that. He could have. have shifted it around a little. He could have. I, I, I think he could have. I, I mean, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have made... T- I don't think it was really logical that Jon like risked so much and came all the way to Dragonstone like why would you make yourself a hostage like that um you know m- maybe you know Danny sends an emissary instead but then they they wanted they wanted like FaceTime and they wanted John and Danny to fall in love and 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 look at some cave doodles and and things like that it really does bug me thinking back on it now like how wasted Tyrion was post book material him going to Danny is supposed to be like the oh yeah things are gonna get so much better now for Danny and Tyrion because they're together, and they just were not able to utilize and write good material for it. Like it's supposed to be like the number one thing that everybody who's a fan of Tyrion and of Danny wanted, and it just fell flat. I think the only time the showrunners, when they didn't have book material to work from, did really well with Tyrion was when they paired him up with Jaime. That was that's always fantastic. And and I mean there's there's one line um, during the Tyrion and Jaime goodbye that I really liked. Um, I almost feel like they somehow stole it from from George R. R. Martin somehow. Mm. But I like the line, um, you know, a million innocent lives for one not so innocent dwarf like uh feels like a good trade or something like that mm-hmm. you know and, and i like that line because he recognizes that he's not that he's not a good person you know that he's that he's done so much bad shit that he needs to atone for because the show seems to forget that he's done all of this bad shit that right. he needs to atone for everybody around him has been calling him a great person and um taking his advice and things like that and him being the the moral um you know, him being the, the arbiter of morality and, you know, at least his character knows that, you know, he's not. So I did I did really like that line. Do you want to uh, get into the whole Jamie Tyrion thing? Because you said something uh, that I thought was hilarious. And uh, yeah, um, but no, Varys dies. Danny, Danny burns him alive. Yeah. Um, you know, rest in peace, Varys. He was one of my favorite background characters just to have. He's not even secondary. He's just there. Um, oh, he's so, fantastic. He's fantastic. And in those early seasons when, when everybody is trying to figure out, like, what is Littlefinger up to? What is Varys up to? There are these wonderful manipulative twins mm-hmm. who, who, are pu- who are being puppet masters. And then all of a sudden they're not, you know. Then they're, then they're just all of a sudden both hanging out, doing really stupid things, um, living past their usefulness, and then being killed, like, on boneheaded moves. 
Like, how, well, how I, I would have loved for Littlefinger to have gone on living, and in a sense, it would still be a Littlefinger Varys fight with Varys supporting Danny, and then later John and Littlefinger supporting Sansa for like the throne. Yeah, and it would be actually even interesting. Ha- yeah, had they all of a sudden been on the same team again, and all of a sudden they'd be like standoffish. You know, because mm-hmm. they start supposedly on the same team, right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. They start mm-hmm. supposedly on Robert's team, but neither on Robert's, neither are on Robert's team. And all of a sudden at the end, they're on the same team again. That would have been, that would have been fun to somehow have that figured out. Like, oh, everybody else has died, and yet somehow we're still advising people. <laughs> <laughs> so Varys dies. Um, Jamie and Tyrion. The way, you made a great point, which is what makes me think that Danny is on to Tyrion. Um, he got in to see this prisoner that he has a bi- mm. bias towards very easily. And I, I, I'm going to go ahead and assume that Danny knows all about it. Danny knew he would try that. Yeah. And Danny just gave the order for the Unsullied to just let him through anyways. I don't think it's the Unsullied being stupid. I think it's just Danny being one step ahead. All right, I'm just trying to think of the advantage. Like, how does letting Jamie into the city help Danny? I don't think she was letting Jamie into the city. I think she was just seeing if Tyrion would betray her again. And kind of freeing Jamie is that final betrayal uh, that she'll deal with later. Because there's nothing a one handed man can do against her. Right. I mean, I mean, one could say, okay, I'm going to let Jamie go in to, to find Cersei, but I'm going to burn them all to death anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, we're going to catch them anyway. Um, why not see if, if Tyrion betrays me? Yeah, we'll see. Well, I mean, we'll see what happens in the end. Like, um, we'll see what happens next episode. But it, it seems like those Unsullied would have to report to their supervisors of what happened. Um, though it is really weird how no one seemed to miss Jamie. Like, it didn't come up. The prisoner's gone. This highly, highly valuable prisoner. Um, but, yeah, it didn't, it didn't come up. Um, so, yeah, I, I, Tyrion has a reckoning uh, next episode. He should, at least. We'll see if it happens. Someone in my comment section was like, their last conversation, it would have been weird if Jamie told him the truth about Tysha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have been really weird. Like, it was such a heartfelt goodbye. And then he's like, I got to tell you something. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> oh, God. Why did you? T- I'm dying tomorrow anyway. It doesn't. The t- dinner is just killing me tomorrow anyway. <laughs> We're getting ahead of ourselves. But I like when Jamie goes through the, the gate and like, he's like, soldier, look, my hand. And then he just goes off into the crowd. There's like a soldier right next to you when you're going into the alleyway. Just show that soldier your hand. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I guess they just didn't care. It was, fu- it is funny how they just made him, they, they, it's, you know, these meta moments. They're like, oh, you were caught, like, trying to go south? How? Because you forgot to, the shine off your hand? Like, you forgot to cover it up? Wow, you're stupid, you know? <laughs> yeah, I am stupid. Okay, so that moment, that moment was, was great. I did love uh, Tyrion and Jamie. I always love Tyrion and Jamie. They always have some of the best moments in the show. Um, but do you want to get to the battle of King's Landing? The sacking oh, of Oh, by the Landing? way, I guess Gary and Lannister is not a, uh, a thing in the show. What do you mean? <laughs> he said you were the only one that didn't treat me like a monster. Oh, right. Gary and Lannister. <sighs> that was uh, one of Tywin's brothers who was always like super, super sympathetic to Tyrion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they they do never mention Gary and Lannister in the show, so mm. um, they, yeah, so oh well. <laughs> but uh, do you want to get to the battle? Yeah, sure. All right, let's talk about the ba- first. Let's get these motherfuckers out of the way. The Golden Company. What the fuck was that? That was such a waste of time. Why even have them in the show? Just have like random cell swords. But I guess no, you, yeah. I guess you mentioned it's like Chekhov's gun. They the Golden Company was mentioned back in season four with Davos and Stannis. So I guess you have to mention them again, right? And they they, they wanted to do something with with the Crown's debt plot, you know, clearly. Like, and it kind of was always the Crown's debt was something that would be brought up like every couple of years as this thing, and <clears throat> it didn't really lead to anything. And then so they they wanted it to lead to something. They led it to the Golden Company. And then all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, we've got too many things to deal with. No elephants, no CGI elephants. Uh, we'll, we'll have this golden company. They really half-assed it, you know. They, they only showed them um, 
either really up close where you can only see like 40 of them or really far away where you can CGI them, you know, but they're, they're never going to have like, you know, 20,000 uh, Golden Company shown on camera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they don't, they didn't really know what to do with it. I mean, um, poor Harry Strickland. He, he, I mean, he did what he could with his no lines, you know, like the guy had less than two to three minutes of screen time. I mean, easiest money ever. All you need yeah. to do is show, you know, all you need to do is come in and have one throne room scene with Cersei and then show up again outside the gates of King's Landing and die. Easiest yeah. job ever. The only person in show business who had an easier job was Mark Hamill in Force Awakens. Yeah, yeah. The, um... <laughs> How he films all the scenes in a weekend. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I was wondering if the horse at the end was Harry Strickland's horse. Somebody says that the, bridles, the bridle is different, but, you know, the horse does look similar. You know, it's white and it's got its, it's got its mane and its eyes. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be the same horse or just a random white horse that just shows up. Um, but Harry Strickland, it's the only other white horse that I really saw in the episode is Harry Strickland's white horse, but I'm not sure if it's the same one or not. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but someone, uh, there's a Lord of the Rings guy who's a, who's a buddy of mine. He goes, you do you realize what that white horse was, right, Carmine? I was like, no, it's the white horse Shadowfax telling, <laughs> telling all Game of Thrones fans, get on. I'll take you to the Lord of the Rings land where things are better and dark battle scenes can be shown in clarity. <laughs> oh, true. Uh, by the way, I, I hate to I hate to break. Are you still recording? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because, you know, this is good so far. Okay, so Danny comes in from the sky and destroys all of your own ships. I love how I love how Drogon's fire breathing isn't just fire breathing, it just explodes everything. It's a missile. Every time it lands on something, everything explodes. You notice this? Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, that, that happened last season, too. Like, <clears throat> you, you shoot a little fire and then everything explodes, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was a little frustrated with, you know, the, the show's desire to, to overpower and then, and then depower and then overpower um, things, you know? Like the scorpions? The scorpions, yeah. Exactly, the scorpions. Like, in this episode, all of a sudden, all of the characters, I mean, Tyrion is like, no, nah, dude, like, Danny's totally going to win. And you're like, well, wait a minute. How, how do you believe that? Like, Braun nearly killed a dragon. Uh, Euron did kill a dragon. Like, how do you think that none of those scorpions have a shot at, at getting Drogon? Had they just had one line, like, she's, she rides it. It's more, you know, it's, it moves. It's quicker. The other dragons didn't have a rider, but actually Braun almost hit her. Braun did hit her um, when she was riding it. So to be fair, to be fair about the whole Braun thing and about Euron killing Rhaegal, I'm not going to defend the show here, but I, yeah. I, there is an argument for it. When Euron killed Rhaegal, they weren't aware of it. She knows what scorpions are, but th it's an ambush. Euron caught her by surprise. They weren't aware of it. That was a complete surprise attack. When she was aware of it, she was able to, like, maneuver and dodge it. So the reason it, the Scorpions didn't work is because she was expecting it, she <clears> went for it, she knows the tactics to take it out and use against it. So it's yeah. not that Euron's a fantastic shot. Euron got lucky in an ambush. But three in a row, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, it was just, uh, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. It, like, I just wish they would have had some sort of explanation. Like, well, you know... Like just at some other point, like Dan, you know, Danny on that dragon makes him a little more, uh, you know, uh, versatile. You know, he she, he can move around a little bit. Or Drogon is the fastest one, you know, or something. Or Rhaegal was was injured, and that's why he couldn't dodge the, dodge the the um, the scorpion. You know, or something. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I agree just, with you. You know, but but it's yeah, it was just because it's true. One like the entire battle would have come down to had Cersei had had one scorpion hit Drogon, you know, different battle. Like, Cersei wins. That's the end. Actually, you know? there. Um, so I, I normally don't do this, but uh, let, I'll get into it in a second. So Danny comes in, destroys the Iron Fleet, and then she's taken out military targets after military targets. She's taken out all the scorpions and the battlements of uh, King's Landing, and she stops, and all of a sudden she breaks in, she, you know, breaks the gates, 
her army charges yeah. in the northern army, and it is a bit of bl- bloodlust. We we've we've seen this documented before, where normal soldiers are turned into like monsters, and yeah. and war makes them that. Like there, it's that high, it's that power trip. They have the upper hand. They have a huge flying death machine over there above. Everybody feels invincible. They're just going in until that one moment where they all stop in in the on the streets, and the Lannister soldiers versus Unsullied and. Um, Jon Snow and his his crew. Now, I normally don't do this, and I said this on Twitter. I normally don't do this, but I don't watch, besides your videos, I don't watch any other Thrones YouTubers. I don't want anybody's ideas to get into my head. However, I did see Angry Joe's um, review of the episode, and he made a mm. fantastic point. Danny's, Danny going all loco on us would have made more sense had she destroyed all the Scorpions with both Drogon and Rhaegal. The ambush at Dragonstone last episode didn't kill Rhaegal, but severely wounded him, yet she took him into battle anyway for this episode. However, when Danny thinks all the scorpions are destroyed, a hidden scorpion comes out of nowhere, kills Rhaegal, and that's her final straw. The bells are ringing, Danny is stopping, and she, she says, okay, I'll do what Tyrion says, the bells have rung, everybody looks like they're surrendering, I'll stop. Hidden Scorpion yeah. comes out, shoots Rhaegal, she goes crazy, fuck everybody, burns everything. That would make more sense. Angry Joe, <clears throat> uh, someone was telling me that he got it from somewhere else. I don't know. I heard it from Angry Joe first. Angry Joe makes a lot of fucking sense with that idea. No, he, he's right. And and I I, I I was recording my Q&A today, and, and, and I'm going to touch on this point as well, is, is they... Um, I feel like George R. Martin would would have a more would have more ambiguity about Danny's um, madness that you'd have to that you you know you're, there's supposed to be debates like is she crazy like a George R. Martin thing would be like oh there's a scene it cuts off and then the next scene King's Landing is burned down and there's just stories of fire and fire and fire and you're wondering like oh like did she go nuts. Did the wild did the wildfire stashes go off? Like, how did the city burn down? What's the state of Danny's brain? Like, it, there would be mystery to it. Um, in in the episode, it's very clear what happens. She just is. She just snaps. And I mean, you're, she. It's supposed to be in reaction to Jora and Missandei and Rhaegal. Just like because you know, Grey Worm snaps too at the same time. Um, so it's not just Danny. I mean, there's the mad, the mad unsullied as well. But the, um, you know, it's just they had a lot of rage, and and a surrender wouldn't have let them like release that rage. You know? Well, someone told what did Benioff said? Benioff said he said something stupid like she looked at the red keep and was like everything that was taken from me, you know, like fuck that. Oh, Which, it's personal now? It's You're personal like, now. That doesn't make any sense because... That doesn't make any sense. Like, it, everything that was taken from me, so I'm just going to destroy it. What? Then just right. take it back. But, like, you were you won. Um, someone else told me the episode's director, Miguel... Uh, I'm going to butcher this guy's name. Spavuchnik? Uh, he said that Daenerys pushed forward with the slaughter in part because the surrender felt too easy. That she and Grey Worm came for blood. Like, they wanted to avenge Missandei right. and all everybody else. And his words were, uh, she, she feels empty. It wasn't what she thought it was. It was not enough. And mm-hmm. I actually like this over what Dave and Dan said. However, yeah. once again, I feel as though if Rhaegal was there, and if Rhaegal was killed, her descent into Matt, and that was the last linchpin that kept King's Landing safe, that kept Cersei safe. Right, right. So she, it, 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 it would have been a little more like manslaughter than murder at that point. Right. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but her, but her going insane, like my problem with the episode is, is I get it. It's supposed to show what someone got on my case for this. They were like, Carmine, you've been podcasting with Preston for two years and you still don't get it. Cause I was bitching about like showing us 30 fucking minutes of like innocent people burning and dying. I just, I just don't want that. I want to see more battle, but he go. this person goes, Carmine, you've been with Preston for so long. You don't get it. The whole the reason they showed us all of that is to show what war really does to people. That the only per, the only people that really lose in the end are the innocent lives that get lost. Yeah, and it, what's sad is that they did that. It took the show that that long to to do that. Um, you know, they should have been doing that from the beginning. You've seen like it the, here and there. Yeah, like the, the depravity of what happens when like 
you know, people are in wartime. We saw that in season two when they all go crazy. Oh, and and uh, uh, and kill the uh, high septon. Yeah. 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 So we see we see it bits and pieces here and there, but not to this extent. Yeah, I mean the the, the show so unapologetically made Danny a hero, which the book never does. You know, the book. Uh, is always ambiguous with Danny. While the show very unapologetically like made Danny a a a protagonist. She she gets into the air, they play their they play their mu- her music. You know, everyone's inspired by her and things like that. And then so this turn seems seems jarring. Well, you know, George R. R. Martin like portrayal of Danny is 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 kind of all over the map. It, there's a dual nature of Danny um, and you know, people people have arguments on the internet of whether or not, you know, Danny is crazy already or moral. So, and you're that that's that's what you're supposed to do. It's you know, it's supposed to be a question. It's supposed to be a debate. It's supposed to draw up converse, draw up conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, versus you know, um, you know, say Cersei, who's absolutely crazy. But even with Cersei in the book. Um, the, the the conversation has a roller it's it's a roller coaster of of what of what goes on you know in the first book you're supposed to think that Cersei's horrible and then her character is repaired quite a bit um, in in book two and three as you find out that she's actually innocent of John Aaron's murder and the the stabbing of Bronn I'm not the stabbing of Bran mm-hmm. and then in the fourth book you find out she's even more nuts than you thought you know and so there's there's this, you know, adventure going back and forth about about her mindset. Um, but Cersei's craziness is more rooted in sadness than in, than in malicious intent. Like you feel bad for her more than you just hate her for it. Uh, book Cersei or show Cersei? <laughs> uh, book Cersei. Show Cersei is, uh, yeah, no. Uh, take take that. Take, make of that what you will. But uh, book Cersei, I just felt, I just felt. I just felt sad for her because I mean she's pathetic. She's, she is. she's a sad, self-centered woman. Mm-hmm. It's it's just it's you know she, but um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I feel bad for her. She's 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 nuts. She's absolutely she's much more nuts in the book than she is in the show. Oh yeah, even even with the raping of a septa uh, scene, you know. Mm-hmm. But what I was um, gonna tell you, um, no, it's just. Danny fans have called this a betrayal of the character, and even Forbes said it. Everybody's been saying it. Everybody's been writing articles about it. I know what Game of Thrones has been once again since season six. It's not been that good. I'm trying to get into the mind of a casual show watcher who's 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 whose mindset is "Wee, let's enjoy it," and I'm trying to do the same. Like my buddy Dave, who thought Arya killing the Night King was the coolest thing ever. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to be in his mindset to enjoy this. But even Forbes said it. Uh, this latest season is not that great, and they had an article here where apparently HBO's president said that they tried getting Dave and Dan uh, more time, and they even tried throwing more money at them to complete out the final season with more episodes, but they just didn't want to do it. Uh, wow. Even George R. R. Martin said, and I quote, I guess Dave and Dan wanted to have a life. And I don't blame them, but I still think we should have gotten more episodes, obviously, to flesh out this whole Danny going, like, you know, being frustrated and just going... Yeah, out of her mind. I mean, and that's that's the thing is is time wise. As as much as I joke, there is plenty of time. Like they didn't need episode two. Like episode two is a big fucking waste of time. But when you look at it another way, episode two is real fucking easy to film. It is. You know. Yeah. Just everybody in some rooms. Put the actors in a room and turn the camera on. I mean, you could also argue that we did have enough time to show her isolation and her loneliness and her advisors being complete and utter idiots. And we, we, like, you could argue that, but at the same time, the whole her, like, going crazy could have been done better. And I just gotta say, I feel bad for all the people in these past 10 years who named their children Khaleesi in honor of this character. Yeah, or, or Daenerys. Right. So let's talk about, uh, while we're on the topic of uh, Cersei, let's talk about Jaime and Cersei. I would argue that Jaime's story was always supposed to end this way. And I'm get, I, mm. I was supposed to release a video today. Uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. Um, yeah. About uh, why I think J- Jaime's uh, arc was not ruined. If you think about it, Jamie's destiny was always to end up with Cersei. Uh, someone chastised the hell out of me in my comment section, and that's and they made a great point. What Jamie is going through is not love; it's addiction, in a sense. And I agree with that. But mm-hmm. it's his form of love, and it is poetic 
justice in a way that they would go out together. I thought, I firmly believed he was going back to King's Landing to kill her. But no, he was going back to King's Landing to make sure, he was going back to King's Landing to make sure that she didn't die alone. And everybody's sitting there saying, this ruined Jamie's character arc. No, it didn't. Because you're confusing Jamie in the show with Book Jamie. Book Jamie burned the letter when Cersei was asking for his help. He, it's supposed to be like a, yeah, fuck you, Cersei mm. moment from Jamie, right? Yeah. In the show, however, Jamie has never once wavered in his love for Cersei. So the the instance in the book where Jamie and Cersei start falling out of uh, uh, not out of love, but fall have a have a weird a weird falling out where they get grow distant from each other is after Joffrey dies, right? Yeah. In the show, however, after Joffrey dies, Cersei and Jamie are still like together. In fact, season four ends with with her about to give him a blowjob, um, and. Season 5, he's doing her bidding. He's going off to Dorne, where they hate Lannisters, to get back their daughter. Yeah. Season 6, he's leading the Lannister army to River Run to break the siege so he can go back to her immediately. He even outs himself as a sister lover to Edmure Tully because he doesn't give a fuck. His mission is to go back to Cersei. In season seven, he's leading her armies and they are openly sleeping together where that one uh, handmaid, hand, handmaid mm -hmm. uh, didn't care. So, Jamie only wavered from Cersei once at the end of season seven when the snows fall and he's leaving her for the betterment of humanity, to go and, and join the fight against the White Walkers. Right. But ultimately, his journey always leads back to her because he can't Im Im he can't he can't imagine himself living in the world without her. This is his addiction. He loves her, even if we don't consider it love. It's a it's a weird fo twisted form of whatever. Mm -hmm. It's still his love for her. Jamie's arc was to always be. It was never about being the hero. It's about being an oath breaker and trying to come back from that and keep some oaths, have some honor. And ultimately, what really kills it for a lot of people is the fact that the show had him say, I never cared about the innocence. Like, why would you have him say that? Like, why would you even write that as a thing? That's what kills it. But I, I'm going to ignore that awful line of dialogue and just go with what we've been having with his character for the longest time. Yeah, so so this is the big thing is is um, people often conflate show Jamie and book Jamie, who are very different characters, very different mm -hmm. characters, and so they see Jamie's book um, story as this redemption arc, and we last see Jamie kind of breaking away from Cersei, though he's even a little conflicted. Even after he burns the letter, he thinks about the temptation of returning to Cersei. Um, but, you know, Jamie's story is about, um, you know, learning to be a better person and keeping oaths and what it means to keep an oath and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one could argue, like, well, doesn't he have an oath to Cersei? Doesn't he have, as much as he has these promises to Catelyn and these, the, you know, these promises to, to Brienne and things like this, and this promise to, to go fight the army of the dead... Doesn't he have a promise to Cersei? I'm sure at some point in their mad love affair, they said that they would always be together, you know? And so one could, one could argue that, that no, that, 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 that's the logical place for Jamie to return to, um, you know, if you wanted. Now, I, I don't necessarily think the show, like, set it up like that. I think they set it up as, you know, she's this addiction. She's always been there. You know, he had this very brief... Um, story of going back up north and, and, and cheating on her and coming back. But other than that, it's, it's, he's been very, very consistent. Yeah, no, he has. And once again, th this is his poison. This is the one thing he all... And this is what I like about, I like about Jamie, because it makes him more human. It makes him very relatable. Yes. Because we all know somebody like that, and we all... And at one point in our lives, we are like that. We are like that li lovesick puppy dog. It's his habit, it's his addiction, it's hard to break, yeah. and he just failed. He tried, it's, it just didn't work it's out It's really him. weird. I mean, I will say it's really weird for someone who's been in a relationship with them for... I mean, he's been in a relationship with Cersei for over 20 years. And that's a little different than, like, you know, you're in your 20s and, you know, you've been seeing somebody a couple months. And, you know, the, 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 so it's, it's, it's strange that he has such passion 
such raw passion where they're where they're having sex with each other uh, next to their son's dead corpse, like kind of passion or, or whatever he, he raping her next to his uh, next to her, her their, their son's dead corpse. I mean, there's a lot of just weirdness about show Jamie and Cersei that will never be explained because nobody has relationships like that. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, from what we've seen in the show, it's not out of character for, for Jamie because Jamie has been, for the most part, very consistently uh, with Cersei. I would say there's almost... People say, oh, well, there is no show Jamie arc. He's just always been with Cersei. You know? No, there is. It, it, it's about honor. It's about oath-keeping. It's, it's about trying to be better even though your girlfriend's a crazy psycho. It's about that. Ch- trying to do better despite all that's going on around you. You know, they, they play things very differently. So even take, even take um, the Siege at River Run. So in the show, Jamie fully admits that he didn't freaking care about anybody at River Run, and he was ready to, to kill them all and go back to, go back to Cersei. In the book, Jamie is very clearly bluffing. He, he's, he's, he's sitting there thinking about his oath to Catelyn and what he's allowed to get away with on the oath. You know, like, he's like, oh, I really hope, you know, I don't have to fight Blackfish because, because that would be breaking my oath. Like, well, you know, so he bluffs and says, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll fight you, well, knowing that, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, or, or he can deny Blackfish claiming, I think, he, I think Blackfish wants to fight him and, 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 and Jamie's like, come on, that I'm, I'm, I'm injured, you'd kill me in a second. And in fact, his real reason for denying him is his oath to Catalan, but, you know, he has these, he has these outs. Um, it's, it's, very, it's very morally complicated. Jamie, Jamie in the show is, is morally simple. He just wants to get back to Cersei. He cares about Cersei. Cersei cares about her kids. Like, it's, it's very basic stuff for, for the show. Not that that's bad. Um, I think in some ways, some ways it works. Um, but it's simpler. You know, he, he loves Cersei, period. You know, that's all there is to it. <laughs> yeah at, like I said I, I don't think his, his arc is ruined um, I think that's really where he was destined to end and he wanted to make sure that she didn't die alone now, because he yeah. would probably regret it the entire time oh absolutely um, he would and there is so everyone brings up this like Valonqar prophecy like over and over again um, that I think the uh, I think the fandom um, became very obsessed with the Valonqar prophecy and and the, the belief that it was 100% true, um, even though it was just what some random witch in the woods said. So, um, but everybody's just like, who's the younger brother? Who's the younger brother? Like, is Jamie the younger brother? He has to kill her. Like, it, it, the Valonqar prophecy has to come true. And then in the end, no, the, the Valonqar prophecy doesn't come true. In and, the show, the show really doesn't give a fuck about prophecy. It really doesn't. There is only one vision that mattered throughout the entire show, and that was the vision in the House of the Undying. And to go back to Danny for a minute here... Um, well, all well, Bran's we, vision. Bran's vision comes true, too. Bran's vision comes true, too, but mostly her vision was the most important one. Yeah. Because she finds herself in the Iron Throne room with snow falling all around her. And you could argue, well, the, the Iron Throne is being covered by snow amidst ruins. Which you could argue, John is going to sit on the throne. Or, that's not snow, it's ash, right. as we saw in this episode. So I mean, that, and that's very cle- that's a very clever subversion. I'm I'm sure it's something that came from George R. R. Martin <laughs> the, with, the, with the ash. Um, obviously, it doesn't it doesn't work. One, if I was going to be nitpicky, I'd be like, well, in that scene, you can hear her crunching on snow. Uh, it's not ash, but it, it works well enough. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I wanted to get back to the Valencar prophecy because there's actually a scene when 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 they si- finally say goodbye to each other. Uh, Jamie and Cersei, and and they're holding each other, and the and the roof comes in on him. His golden hand actually shines in in their last moment, and his hand is on the back of her neck. Now, the Valencar prophecy actually says that his hand will be around her throat, which usually means the front, you know, and mm-hmm. that he'll he'll choke the life out of her. While you know here it's on the back of her neck. And, you know, maybe, you know, as the, 
maybe as the the roof comes down, it's pressured down to take out, you know, choke the life out of her. I don't know, but it seems like they did focus That's a on stretch, his... my yeah, dude. Absol- That's a stretch. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, but the, but they did oddly shine his hand, like visually, his hand shines like as they die. Um, uh, and, and of course, that almost that could also be um, Golden Hand. I don't know if you remember from the book how how Jamie is like, huh? If I'm a good enough person long enough, maybe I won't be Kingslayer. I'll be Golden Hand. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'll be so generous. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why the show chose to do it or what it means. Maybe they just th- you know throwing throwing shit at a wall and and hoping something sticks. But um, the fandom is very angry that the Valencar prophecy didn't come true. Well, I, I'm not angry because the prophecies mean nothing in the show. It, they mean nothing. They yeah. mean absolutely nothing. Because in order to do prophecy, you have to do visions and flashbacks. And they haven't, they've haven't. they only done one flashback ever. Actually, no, two, I think. Two? Two. Um, with, um, with um, Maggie the Frog. No, they, Maggie the Frog was the only flashback they ever did where it doesn't require Bran to touch yeah. a tree. Yeah, yeah. I'm, ta- I'm not talking about Weirwood, uh, you know, visions. I'm talking right, about, like, right. just flashbacks in general. It's the only flashback we've ever gotten. So in order to do that, we need more of that, and we don't have that. The show doesn't care about prophecy, so I really take it with a grain of salt, the Valencar prophecy. I really do. Yeah. Um, and speaking of things that did not make any sense uh, or we did not get, Kyburn's death, you so fucking called it. Oh, my God, stop. <laughs> you, you you said on the last live stream like the one thing that would annoy the hell out of you is if you know like he dies and, and we about, find nothing about his past or why we he, find out nothing about his past why he was at Heron Hall like what he did to this because the, the fight with the hound in the mountain was so cool I didn't like that they cut away so much but thank mm-hmm. god people on YouTube download that shit and cut it together some guy <laughs> sent me I asked someone in the comment section to uh, I asked someone in my video to make a compilation of them fighting in that episode and just put like that Star Wars theme Duel of Fates in there and they did it. Well, Thank they you they, to they were person. cutting away to try to create parallels to Arya. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't think the parallels work. The parallels only would have worked had Arya been scarred like the Hound was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like in the but, eyes or whatever, yeah. Or in the eyes or like half her face is burned. Like that would have been fine, but at one point the Hound stabs the mountain through the face and he still lives he's still going i want to know what kyburn did with the mountain why he's just so like if 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 kyburn somehow has access to white technology white walker like stuff how did he get his hands on that was he a wildling was he in the north like who who is he where's he from what's funny what's funny is how they played it because so so in the book, there, there's so much uh, ambigu- ambiguity around Sir Robert Strong. Like, we don't know anything about his nature right now. And so, you know, in my, you know how I always play devil's advocate and say, well, maybe there's no magic. Um, you know, and so what if there's nothing supernatural going on with the mountain? That t- uh, Oberyn poisoned him. He had kidney failure. And Oberyn um, and uh, Kyburn. The reason he keeps killing people and taking and, and operating on them is that he keeps trying to put in new kidneys and blood transfusions to mm-hmm. keep the to keep the mountain alive. And the reason you know he, we, no one ever sees the mountain go to the bathroom is because he craps into a colostomy bag and does dialysis because Oberyn's poison fucked up his entire like you know intestinal and and uh, kidney and urinary system. You know right. Um, and so, you know, maybe the mountain actually is just a regular dude with, a, with failed kidneys. You know, like, that's, that's it. Um, but the show has clearly made him into an undead monster. So that right. has super strength. That can be stabbed through the fucking brain with a knife and be fine. I was going to say, maybe, like, Kyburn did some kind of, like, I don't want to say lobotomy, but, like, maybe Kyburn fucked with his brain and, and made him more docile and more, like, prone to commands and stuff like that. And, you know, a complete and utter slave and servant. And But being stabbed through the face didn't kill him. So I'm, I'm sitting there wondering, what the fuck? And you know what it would have been great, though, in that mm. moment when the Hound sees that the mountain was stabbed in the face and he's not dead? Had your idea... Back for back from season seven, episode one. Do you remember your idea 
you had for the Hound, where him and the Brotherhood, they come across that cabin of those people that he abandoned and stole all their money from in Season 4. They starved to death and they froze to death as well. Yeah. Your idea was he was going to dig a grave for them, but because the Earth was, like, frozen, yeah. he just can't do it. He breaks down because nothing he does, like, he, he's a failure. He can't do anything right. Remember that idea you had? Yeah. yeah. Had that idea been implemented... It would have been perfect for this scene because the mountains in the mountain, the hound's entire storyline has always been him trying to do something and failing. He tried to get Sansa out of King's Landing. He failed. Mm. He tried getting Arya to the twins. Failed. He then tried getting Arya to the Vale, um, into the Eyrie. Failed. He tried starting a new life with those, uh, the, the Christian community. Failed. He, <laughs> like... He's tried to do so much much stuff, and he always fails. He failed his last friend, if you could call him that, Beric, yeah. in a sense. He's failed at so many things, and he just failed to kill his brother. And that could have been his breaking point where he just says, fuck it, tackles him, and they both go into the flames. It would have yeah. been, it, had, they, had they done your idea, it would have been so perfect, would have come <clears throat> full circle. I also, one thing I also wish they, and this is something very, very subtle from, from the book that um, is never brought up in the show because it's one of these, it's one of these one-liners that's so important but, but everyone kind of forgets. So most people think that the Hound hates um, the mountain because, you know, he took his face and he put him into fire and he melted half of his face. And that's true. That's that's an enormous thing on why the on why the hound hates the mountain. But there's another reason why the hound hates the mountain. Um, there's a younger sister. Uh, the hound had a younger sister. Oh, that's right. And the mountain likely killed the younger sister. There's this idea that maybe when the hound looks at Sansa and Arya, he sees a bit of his younger sister. Mm. Um, and that's why he wants to protect them. Um, but, you know, it was never brought up in the show. and, and it, you know, it could have bad. been in that scene they had, with, like the scene where he had with Sansa, which, by the way, that was kind of in poor taste. I'm normally not someone to bitch about this kind of stuff, but, yeah. like, where, where the hound goes, they broke you in, huh? Like, bro, really? Do you really have to say that? Like, yeah, come on. Yeah, like, what yeah. are you doing? I mean, was that yeah. really necessary right that's just being a dick <laughs> right exactly like it really is she could have said like why do you care why did you like when i was with joffrey why did you never follow his orders to beat me and he could have said like you know when i was your i uh, had a younger sister you remind me a lot of her an innocent bird and it, she the, the bird was was killed by my brother and it's it, you, you right. could have had that in there and then and then that could that conversation could have been the impetus on why he suddenly wants to go to King's Landing to kill him. Right. Mm. Oh my God, we just we just solved the whole fucking season. Jesus. <laughs> God damn it. That would have done it. That would have been perfect. It's so fucking sad because I had to stop reading comment section uh, on my video. I, I haven't done it. I only done one Q&A this entire season. I haven't done any more. I can't go into my comment section because of spoilers. People love to be dicks. But it's crazy. If you go into the comment section, you will find everyday fucking people. And we mentioned Angry Joe a while back. Yeah. These pe people who aren't who are just fans write better mate you write better <laughs> material for the show than people paid to write fucking material for the show. It's mind it's mind boggling. It really is. They're just trying to do it too fast, you know. I think that's it. Cause I, you know, I realize when when. You know, when anytime somebody puts, you know, tries to pu pump out something fast, it just, it's just, it's not quality. You know, you need time to really think about something, mull it over, throw ideas off of other people. Like, that's the thing is like, you know, the idea, I, I had a small little idea, then we talked it out, and then we came up with something that I think, man, that would have been a fucking brilliant scene, actually. Because my big complaint about the Hound is all of a sudden, for no reason, he fucking wants to go to King's Landing. It could have been Sansa being like, you know, really, you know, what makes me feel better. You should have gone and killed that guy for, for something like that or, you know, something. Or, it's, or just that conversation itself reminding him that he needs to take him down, you know, uh, about his little sister. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would have been great. 
Speaking of things that would have been great, uh, I, I even tweeted out, the one person probably hoping that Arya dies this episode from all this falling debris is mm. Preston. That would have been great, but no, she didn't. Oh, God. She, she should have died like seven times from people uh, s like stomping on her spine as they were trying to get away, from debris falling, and from dragon fire. Ar Arya's the last person that will ever die in the show, <laughs> okay? The, 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 the sun will go out, the Westerosi sun will go out, and, and Arya will still be fucking smirking. Or doing her duck face. She wasn't smirking for the... What doesn't make any sense is, like, the entire last two seasons, she's like, let's get this done. I'm ready. Listen to me, girl. You don't want to... I'm making him... I'm making the Hound Batman for a minute here. You don't want to be like me. Look at me! You don't want to be like me. And and then she has, like, those big eyes that she had from, like, earlier yeah. seasons. And then, all of a sudden, she's season three, Arya. I'm really... I'm So, I've, I've gotten really focused on, on, on Arya's mouth. She has, like... Wait, what? She's, oh no, no, no! She she does these. She does a bunch of like mouth and lip movements to 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 uh, project her emotions. So she'll often do her duck face, which which she like pops out her lips. So if she, you know, and I, I don't, she does that a lot. So for instance, uh, when they when when Santa and Arya like took John aside and they're like, we need to talk to you. Like Arya has her like duck face on. She she pouts out these lips. Like, mm, right? we need, we need. And then when she's like upset and um, indignant, she'll take both of her teeth, her, her upper and lower jaws, and, the, and he'll put the teeth on top of each other rather than, you know, the inside. Like You've her, been thinking about this. Oh, Holy God, because I realize it's just really unnatural movements. Like, who does that? Like, <laughs> who all of a sudden, like, pouts in her duck face, like, like, during conversations, or who who takes their teeth and like brings them up like that, like someone very cringy, right? And, and and so like and who smirks, you know, and her smirks and stuff like that. It's just they've been they've been it, it's been very frustrating. Like ever like and and I guess my hatred of the character has like has just been spilling over into so many things. <laughs> you hate this character so much, you focus oh on every little God. thing. Oh my God! And her poor like. She just she got that mother and that mother and daughter killed. I <laughs> just so she went she went into like we all get out of here. You're going to die if you stay here. We'll die if we go out there. No, just follow me. She takes all those people out of the safety of that place and they all just well, die. They don't they don't all go. Only some of them go. <laughs> we have Jesus no idea. Christ. I mean, maybe we have no idea if that place like survives, but it, it's just a mystery. But certainly everybody that left died. Because they didn't have Arya's plot armor. Like, you can't go out in the middle of Dragonfire. She doesn't fire. have plot armor. She has Thanos-level <laughs> Infinity Gauntlet plot armor. Like, John, swords and arrows don't hit John. De actual falling debris, buildings, fire doesn't kill her. She actually gets knocked out and wakes up twice. Tw oh, did she really? I actually, I've seen this episode three times. I kind of skip all the Arya right. stuff. Right, like, really it's, so, it's so cliche for someone to like, I mean, first of all, they've done it in the show a million times. Like someone getting knocked out and then waking up and, and having absolute disaster happen all around them. And it's, somehow they're okay. It happens twice to her. She gets knocked out and wakes up twice. Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> so heated. <laughs> Just so... Ugh. It's just, it was such a pointless, like, she traveled thousands and thousands and thousands of miles down to King's Landing, all the way in, to then be told, no, don't go any further, then to just have massive plot armor, and then that fucking horse. <laughs> <laughs> what was, so, so, what I don't understand is, the horse, like, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't get it, I, what? Um, I mean, some people say, well, like, okay like, like maybe it's a pot like so they mentioned that um you know it was very apocalyptic the feel of the hound and uh and the mountain fighting so therefore you're gonna have like a pale mare you know like from the book of apocalypse you know from the from a, you know the book of uh of uh armageddon you know uh, Revelation, the Book of Revelation. I'm not familiar with it, so you, you might have to go into more a bit more detail about it. Uh, oh, um, so, w so during during Revelation, there's some very famous things about the end of the world, and they're they're all written kind of poetically. So, you know, they'll start talking about the Lamb, and the Lamb represents Jesus, and they'll you know, and then there's breaking of seals, 
And then, we, you know, there's a horseman of the apocalypse coming forward. And so death rides a pale, a pale mare. And, um, and so this is a big thing. This appears in the book, too. Like, there's all sorts of apocalyptic imagery. Or, you know, when, when, when Ramsey says, come and see, or come see, like, that's from the book of Revelation. Because so when the, when the seals are broken, they say, come and see. And, you know, it's... And, then the horsemen of the apocalypse like appear with each seal being broken. Um, and this kind of stuff is all over literature and pop culture and, and, and um, uh, Johnny Cash lyrics and all sorts of stuff. So it's, it, it, you know, it's sometime read, read Revelation and all of a sudden you'll be like, oh, that, okay, that's everywhere. But yes, uh, pale, a pale mare is, is death. Okay, so that symbolism here, maybe. If I'm, she's riding the pale mare. She's 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 becoming the, the embodiment of death or something. I don't know. So so are they trying to allude that she's gonna bring death to Danny? I I probably, but I don't know. I mean, I kind of think John has to stab her. In the I mean, if they already gave stabbing, uh, the Night King to Arya, are they gonna give it to Arya again? Mm, she uh, Danny has green eyes. I'm. It, this is what I said in my review. Like, if they had Arya kill Cersei, people would write right in the streets. There's no way they can give our killing all these character these main characters to our one character, one character who's not even. I don't want to I say mean, they gave, not they, popular. They, they, they love is. like subverting expectations and that you know thought it was going to be Theon or Yara facing off with Euron, and then it's Jaime, the last person I would have fucking expected. Do we even do, do we even want to talk about the Euron Jamie fight? That was so <laughs> stupid. I, I I don't even care about it. I really don't. <laughs> it was just so fucking random and stupid and dumb. Like these people shouldn't be fighting. Like, like why been, do they care? Like they, why do they care? Like yeah, <laughs> he should be trying to escape. Euron should be trying to escape and get back. To, you know, get find a ship and do do his find thing. something. You know, steal that. Like if they were fighting for that little boat, fight then for the that dinghy. would make more sense. Fight for, fight for the dinghy so they can sail to Pentos. Right, like if they're <laughs> fighting for that boat, that would make more sense. But and and then he goes, "I'm the man who killed Jamie." Who cares? No, and you weren't. You killed actually. a dragon, dude. That's <laughs> right? much more impressive. Wait, <laughs> you already killed a fucking dragon. Fuck Jamie Lannister. <laughs> like you're on. You're awesome. Okay, you you're a very impressive, dude. Thousand ships, king of the Iron Islands. You know, you know. Fuck Cersei. You did a lot of great stuff. You you killed a fucking dragon. You mm-hmm. destroyed Danny's fleet, not once, not twice, but three fucking times. <laughs> you did a time. lot of fucking shit. Uh, ja- killing Jamie Lannister, no one fucking cares. Okay? Nobody cares. If you killed you know, Jamie Lannister ten years ago, that would be something. Golden Hand Jamie Lannister, eh. Right. I mean, does anyone remember who Locke was? Because he chopped off fucking Jamie Lannister's hand. No one fucking remembers him. Exactly. I don't know. Let's. let's overall, <laughs> I thought the episode. I think that's it. I thought the episode was okay. Uh, do you have anything else to say about it? Because oh, I'm I mean, trying to think anything good. Oh, well, I mean, I kind of think John should have. Do you think John is complicit in this? In the sense that he didn't tell his people to back the fuck off more he could have tried harder getting people out of there i guess but at the same time though in the midst of war when everybody's just going crazy and have they have that bloodlust and you know everybody's hyped and they're on, on that power trip i i can't blame him for like not i can't blame the soldiers for doing what they did it's he, the he same looked thing like he was in shock like he just didn't know what to do yeah and frozen. i mean he too would like everybody's been kind of warning him about danny and he just probably felt like an asshole at that point for not listening. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he well. thought he knew her better than that, and there you go. I mean, they went on that date. <laughs> <laughs> what was the point of John riding a dragon? None. <laughs> so we can get him fighting the Night King on Visceron. Oh, right. Is, is it Visceron? Did I say it right? The, the Night King's dragon. I guess he was on Rhaegal. Uh, no, 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 no. Night King was on Viseron. Did I say Viseron yeah. correct? Viserion? Is it Viserion? It doesn't, ma- it doesn't matter. Who knows? It's, it's whatever <laughs> you want. 
<laughs> it could be visor on. It doesn't matter. <laughs> visor on. I should totally just do that just to piss people off. Uh, Preston, are we done here? This episode was... Uh, whatever. <laughs> you, got, you got me riled up near the end. <laughs> <laughs> All they have to do is talk about Arya. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, the episode for what it is now, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to be as casual as possible so I can enjoy it. For what it was, it was fine. The Euron thing was stupid. Arya, I'm not even gonna get into anymore. The Danny stuff, I just wish it made more sense. Had we if, had Rhaegal die, it for her, the most part was battle, so it's like hard to really comment on 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 battle because it was just a lot of carnage. Pretty much, and like I said, the carnage is fine. I just don't want to see. I just want. I, I. I would rather see more people fighting each other in the streets. That would be cool. One of the best bell battles in in the the series in general. I'm talking about both book and show that I would have loved to have seen on screen is the Battle of the Bells during Robert's uh, Robert Baratheon's uh, Robert Robert's Rebellion, and that's the that's where John Con and Robert are trying to find each other during this like insane battle where people are just fighting in the streets through like buildings and stuff and houses yeah. it's just an intense fight and ultimately john Khan's inability to kill robert is what throws him into exile right yeah and 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 haunts him for years and years mm -hmm. yeah. and i would have loved for for the fighting to have gone down like that and it didn't it was a it was a slaughter it was essentially the night king slaughtering everybody all over again but instead of the night king it's danny and her forces yeah. So, well, at least at least Arya didn't stab Cersei and have her become the Night Queen. At least that didn't happen. I, at least the most ridiculous <laughs> scenario didn't happen. Thank God. But uh, I, I think your I think your more of your predictions have come true than not. So we'll we'll see. Okay. I mean, what I what do I think is going to be the dumbest thing? I think like John stabbing Danny through the heart. John stabbing Danny through their heart and crying and like them holding each other and him telling her that he loves her like as she dies, I think that would be the dumbest thing. <laughs> I feel like you read the leaks and that's what happens. I no, I, no I, that I just came up with like it's because it's like it's so close to um, the Azora High prophecy that he has uh -oh. to like stab Nisa Nisa, so he has to like stab Danny and then as he holds it. He's just like, you know, I, I love you. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. As always, uh, leave your thoughts down below, and we'll see you all next time. Have a good one.